this is the first CIPLA event for the, for the new year. And I think we're starting the year with some fireworks. I'm thrilled to intro introduce Dr. Alan Toon, who will speak on the proposed pandemic treaty and the relative importance of IP. Now, sometimes when chairs introduce speakers, they have to try and drum up a little bit of interest in both the speaker and the topic, almost like an MC at a comedy gig. But I don't have to do that today. The topic and the speaker effectively announce themselves, so I'll be very brief. The pandemic and new medical technologies are an inescapable part of our intellectual landscape and our in our day to day thoughts. Indeed, the World Health Organization's idea to discuss drafting a global pandemic treaty seems like one of the few responsible developments in our globalized world. But what will the treaty say? As our speaker is an inescapable part of the global discussions about IP and the pandemic. Alan's biography is available on, online, yet you only really need to know two parts of it. Alan started the medicines patent pool, which is perhaps the most effective mechanism developed to increase access to life-saving medicines for low and middle-income countries. And secondly, her opinion on IP in the on IP in the pandemic has been sought by effectively every global governance organization. A pandemic treaty could play a monumental role in the trajectory of our global society. And the rules on IP in that treaty will significantly affect its influence. But that's enough from me, except to say audience, please write your questions in the q and I'll collect them and pose them to Alan at the end. And now, Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John, for this very generous, uh, very generous int introduction. No, no pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I would like to thank you for, for, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. I, I regret um, many, many times in the week that uh, we still can't or, or yeah, we, we, we still can't, can't meet in, 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 in person. Um, I think we're all a little bit fed up with our life on on Zoom, but I'll I'll try to do a, I'll try to do a good job. Um, so I was asked to um, to talk about the COVID nineteen uh, pan, uh, pandemic and the, the the developments around the pandemic treaty, and I should perhaps start by with saying that there are proposals for a pandemic treaty, but it isn't at all clear yet whether the pandemic treaty negotiations will actually kick off. That is a subject for discussion at the World Health Assembly, which will meet uh, later this year in, uh, in November. But there is certainly a lot of activity around it and a lot of buzz around it. And I'll explain uh, in this presentation why that is and what I hope uh, we will be able to achieve on questions related to intellectual property in these pandemic treaty, uh, pandemic treaty talks. Uh, first of all, my uh, interest declaration, the fee for this lecture is paid by the, uh, by the organizers. Um, I am otherwise uh, most, no, not mostly, I am self-employed. I work for non-for-profits for academia, governments, and the United Nations. I do not work for the private sector. Occasionally our group has a grant from foundations and uh, currently we have a small grant, for example, from UNITAID to work on uh, COVID-19 related work. Uh, all our work is, is available for free on our website. I always say, if you're rich, you can of course pay for it, but most people actually never do so, which is also fine. Now, the COVID-19 crisis, um, I think by now you're familiar with it, a global pandemic of unprecedented proportions in recent history. Um, it, uh, it's not a pandemic that, hasn't, that wasn't foreseen. I sat through many years of World Health Assembly gatherings where almost every di director general of the WHO presses upon the member states the need to be prepared for a pandemic outbreak. It wasn't a question whether, but uh, more of when uh, that would happen. And uh, here we are with the COVID-19 crisis. Now, in terms of uh, the response to this crisis, we've seen an absolute unprecedented response from the world of science. Global collaboration between researchers, 
um, in a very open spirit uh, in, in where, where you saw researchers um, share uh, data and findings at a very early stage uh, with colleagues all over the world. Um, we also saw billions of public financing for research and development becoming available very rapidly, which, which, which helped enormously the development in particular of the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, it also, of course, led to the creation of new intellectual property and all the tensions that go, uh, that come with that. A few words about the global public expenditure. In 2020, um, the, about, about 93 billion was spent on research and development of vaccines and therapeutics. Now, 95% of that amount went to vaccines. So that is around 88.3 um, billion. And three quarters of that went to small and medium-sized enterprises. So a lot of that uh, was spent on um, academ academic work, but also small uh, 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 biotech uh, corporations. BioNTech, uh, which no longer is a small biotech, um, benefited, for example, of uh, from four, 445 million euro uh, funding by, um, by the German government, and in addition 50 million by the European Investment Bank. That was for the vaccine that subsequently would become the Pfizer vaccine, but that vaccine was developed by, uh, by BioNTech. 18% of this, this money went directly to large pharmaceutical uh, corporations. This is a very good thing. This is exactly what you want to see happen uh, in a pandemic response, the ready availability of the financing that are necessary to develop these vaccines. But the missed opportunity in all of that lies in the fact that these, this spending took place without conditions attached. This would have been an opportunity to require that intellectual property, and that is not only patents, but also includes the knowledge and the know-how, and technologies as such generated with this public financing is shared. That would have been the opportunity to fulfill the promise to promote vaccines as global public goods. You may remember that early on, in the pandemic that um, we often heard these terms, global public goods or global common goods. Uh, the, the head of the European Commission, Ursula von, von der Leyen, uh, said at a, at a, at a funding, uh, uh, funding rally uh, that um, uh, the money would be spent in such a way that, that the vaccines would be developed as a, as a common good. Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, uh, pro promised that no one would own this, uh, this vaccine. Now, in the agreement between the European Commission and the member states, you, you find that back in a negotiating directive that said, uh, this was the, the negotiating directive that, um, uh, that was, was established as part of the mandate for the European Commission to negotiate the, uh, the supply, the purchase of vaccines on behalf of all the member states. And the commission had committed to promoting the vaccines of global, global public good. This is the text of that particular negotiating directive. You see here, the commission will promote COVID-19 vaccines as a global public good. And then um, uh, relating related questions with pharmaceutical industry regarding international intellectual property sharing, especially when such IP has been developed with public support in order to meet these objectives. And that would have been in, in every, every case. But if you look at those agreements as far as possible, because a lot of it is blacked out, but if you look at the text of the, of, of the agreements and some of these agreements, these advanced purchase agreements actually did uh, become available uh, in, in full text or were leaked or were blacked out so badly that you could remove the black, um, you would not find any terms and conditions that would have been a translation of that principle of promoting vaccines as a global public good. So that is part of 
what, what I mentioned earlier as the missed opportunity when you start spending such vast amounts of, of, of money, um, you, you could have um, attached strings to that, conditions to that. Now, what we've also seen in the last uh, year and a half is various initiatives for the IP and know-how sharing, because fairly quickly it became clear that the need for uh, the vac to, to vaccinate the world globally um, would require a, a vast number of, of doses, about 11 billion. The world's capacity, the entire capacity of vaccine production, so not just COVID-19, but all vaccines is around 3 billion. So even if you would use all the capacity present, you would never get to the 11 billion and you would get to a situation where other vaccines would not be produced and is not desirable. So the sharing of this know-how and intellectual property became very important to help ramp up. A further important reason for the sharing of that manufacturing know-how is the fact that in certain regions, manufacturing capacity is almost non-existing. So you need to create that, but you can't do that without the short access to these, uh, to these elements. Now we've seen a number of um, voluntary uh, in initiatives. Um, in May, 2020, the World Health Organization created the COVID-19 technology access pool. This was somewhat modeled after the medicines patent pool. And it is, it, it is, uh, it is functioning with the support of the, of the medicines patent pool. Um, but it is of course dependent on the voluntary uh, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the will of uh, those entities that hold those rights to, to engage with them. The World Health Organization this year has established mRNA technology transfer hubs that is currently focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa to establish mRNA manufacturing capacity in Sub-Saharan Africa. The Medicines Patent Pool, fairly early on in May 2020, expanded its mandate to be able to work on COVID-19. Um, and as far as corporations are concerned, uh, there is the, um, the policy of, of AstraZeneca, which, is, is, which has brought the, the, the Oxford vaccine to market. Um, AstraZeneca has very early on entered into licensing and tech transfer agreements with large scale manufacturers in developing countries, in particular in India and in Brazil. So AstraZeneca um, I, I would say has a slightly different approach, has taken a different approach from the other companies that have said, no, no, we will not be sharing our technology. Uh, we will do all of this uh, in-house. We've also seen uh, some proposals or initiatives for non-voluntary measures. And some of that is taking place at the World Trade Organization's Strips Council as we speak, where in October of last year, uh, South Africa and India made the proposal for a pandemic waiver, which would allow countries to suspend the protection of, uh, of, of intellectual property with regard to COVID-19 countermeasures uh, for the duration of the pandemic. So it's a rather, um, a rather modest proposal, very much uh, limited to the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, that proposal has been in discussion uh, since, uh, since October and very little progress uh, has been made. Uh, we've also seen some, um, some movement at national level where countries scrambled to get prepared to issue compulsory licenses should that be necessary. Germany uh, took some measures, Brazil has taken some measures, and a number of a number of other countries, but I, sh I should mention here that uh, while compulsory licensing can be very useful when we're talking about small molecules or not too complex technologies, but in the case of vaccines, in addition to the access access to to the patents, you need access to the technology itself. You need to have that transfer. You need to have a level of collaboration by um, by those that hold that knowledge. Otherwise, it is um, it, it's very difficult to um, 
to make or, and, and incredibly time consuming because you would basically have to do all the research yourself. The, the, best, uh, the best scenario, of course, is to have the transfer of the technologies that have a regulatory approval and get, get the playbook how to make them according to those same, to those same standards. Now, none of these global initiatives for technology sharing have come to fruition. Uh, the COVID-19 technology access pool is, um, is, is empty. Um, we've seen high income countries uh, ordering and pre-ordering vaccines, um, multiple, sometimes multiple times over what they need to give their population. Uh, to vaccinate our population. 75% of the vaccines administered today are administered in 10 countries. And it's interesting to see that those are also the countries where uh, the vaccines are produced. The African region is, is suffering the most uh, from this situation where uh, less than 3% of the population is vaccinated with one dose. So despite the fact, but despite this situation and despite the fact that there is unused manufacturing capacity out there in the world, in various regions in the world, um, requests for licensing and tech transfer by companies that would be, um, uh, would be able to produce these vaccines has been systematically uh, refused. So an important lesson from what has happened so far is that the reliance on the voluntary measures uh, does, not, uh, does not deliver. Also that it is very difficult to regulate the sharing of IP and know-how and technology whilst in, a, in the middle of a global health emergency. Uh, there, there was an understanding that it would be important to do this. That's why we've heard the politicians talk about global public goods and, and we will share this and no one will own the vaccine, but no one actually had the courage to translate that into um, enforceable measures, whether through, through contracts, con conditions in contracts or whether through, through legislation. In the meantime, considerable commercial interests are at stake. And that is, is leading to a situation that it even becomes, uh, becomes more, more, more difficult. Um, I, I first want to go to, uh, to Pfizer. Uh, this slide shows you the sort of the turnover of, 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 of Pfizer, the annual turnover of Pfizer. And in this year, almost half of Pfizer's turnover will be because of, will be the, the sales of the COVID-19 vaccine. So the commercial interest, the, the value of this product has become so huge that the demand to share this technology with others um, to get a positive response to that demand is becoming more and more difficult. This is playing out at the moment in the United States where Moderna, that is the other manufacturer of the mRNA vaccine, um, again, a vaccine developed with vast amounts of public financing, um, Moderna refuses to uh, prioritize uh, low-income countries. And to the point that this is even frustrating the, the Biden administration and there are now in a in a uh, sort of fighting over this at at this at this very moment, um, very few of Moderna's um, vaccines have gone to low and low and middle income countries. Um, Moderna actually is a company that fairly early on said we will focus on high income countries. They didn't promise any humanitarian action with their vaccine but that doesn't make it right. That, that is the problem. These are vaccines that should be global goods because we cannot 
vaccinate ourselves out of this pandemic if these vaccines are not available globally. And the problem now is that these companies are the ones that decide whether the vaccine becomes available, when and where. And that is hugely problematic. At the same time, um, if you look at the consequences for this company, Moderna, which is a company that before the COVID-19 vaccine had no product. Actually, the vaccine is the only product that this company has. The share price has gone up from $28 to $450, which is a growth of, of about 14, 1400%. All to say that the companies are not incentivized to do the right thing for global health. They can have these policies that are really detrimental to the health of people in low and middle income co countries, ultimately to the health of all of us, because if those vaccines are not available everywhere, you keep having pockets or in some cases entire areas where the virus can go rampant and that will ultimately affect everyone, of course. Um, but that does not affect their bottom line. And that makes policymaking with regard to these companies very, very difficult. So um, on to the future, um, uh, the future pandemic uh, preparedness, because in a way the pandemic treaty talks, while sparked, uh, because of this, uh, this the crisis we're in today um, is very much looking at the future and how can we be better prepared for for the next time around. Um, the pandemic treaty is proposed at the seventy fourth World Health Assembly, and as I said at the beginning of this lecture, there will be a a special session of the assembly. Uh, later this year to actually make the decision to, 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 to move ahead with it or not. And um, I, I strongly believe that this treaty needs to address the access to IP, the know-how and technology transfer obligations. That should go hand in hand with the commitment to public financing of the needed innovation. If you want to have a conversation about accessing whether mandatory or voluntarily, the IP and know-how, you have to have also a commitment of, uh, for, for the financing, for the development of these, uh, of these innovations. So here are some of the elements that, um, that I think a treaty could, uh, could address. First of all, incentivize the voluntary sharing of IP and know-how. And voluntary sharing could, for example, also mean um, make sure that there are resources for the buyout of, um, of the IP. I must say, I'm, I, after I saw the sales figures of these companies, this this is this is, we have to recognize that this is of course a problem because how large should that buyout buy buyout then be? Um, and there's also there's of course an issue of timing because if you do it too late and you would have to cough up 40, um, 40 billion a year, then that's not really that's not really going to to happen. That's that that is why intervention much earlier in the development phase of a product is very important. Now, mandate the sharing of IP and know-how, as I discussed earlier, for example, through conditioning the funding for the research and, uh, and development. Support global pandemic IP know-how sharing. In, that should include regulatory data and regulatory, uh, and regulatory transfer platforms such as CTAP and the MPP. The regulatory data is very important to make sure that products can become available everywhere, but also often regulatory data contains important information that enables others to produce uh, the products. Further, um, we need investments in supporting the development and scale up of production capacity to ensure sufficiency in all regions of the world. 
there are certain parts of the world where there's almost no vaccine production at all, no matter what vaccine we're talking about. If you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, there are there is a, a vaccine facility in Senegal and there's a little bit in South Africa, but not much more. And I, I think that is very much recognized that that needs, that needs to change, but that will not change without uh, sufficient financing and, and assistance from those that hold the, the technology. And there's some talk about that at the WHO. At the moment, I mentioned the mRNA hubs, for example, that, that, would, be, that would be one way one way forward. But if you do not have the support and the fi financing mechanisms for that in place, it's going to be difficult to make sure that that comes off the ground. Support the adequate supply of necessary inputs such as uh, raw materials for that production will of course be key and ensure optimal distribution of pandemic health technologies for public health uh, needs in all regions of the world. And there, the theme of equity is very important. At the early days of the, of the pandemic, uh, at the WHO, uh, COVAX was established. And the, this, the purpose of COVAX was um, the equitable distribution of the products that would be developed once they became available so that we would not end up in the situation we have today that the wealthy nations would get the vaccines first and the poorer nations would get them much later, if at all. The plan was that everyone would procure through this COVAX mechanism and it would be distributed based on an equitable distribution plan, which would allow for the most vulnerable people first, healthcare workers first, wherever they are on the planet. That is, of course, not the situation we're in today. In our wealthy countries, there are serious plans to start giving, and in some cases, it's already happening, booster uh, vaccines or to start vaccinating children, even though they're not really at the same high risk as, as other people, uh, whilst other, well, healthcare workers in Africa, for example, haven't even received their first dose. Now that is an inequity that should, um, that should, not, be, uh, that should not be happening. And, and countries need to come together to, to, to discuss that and make sure the next time around, this is done differently. Uh, support, including financing the development of new pandemic health technologies under the condition that the IP and know-how developed with this public financing is shared um, openly. And that is, I think I've made that point uh, sufficiently uh, before. Uh, these, this, is a tall, this is a list of, of tall orders. I understand that these things are not easy and they're certainly not easy to, to, to regulate. And you can have lofty goals at the international level, but what we saw in this pandemic also um, a real, um, a sort of countries going back to very nationalist approaches where uh, governments and ministers of health had to you know prioritize their own populations and felt they couldn't really um, uh, look beyond the beyond the, the immediate interest of the of the country so that's um that, with that, I've come to the um, to the end of my uh, of my presentation. Um, I, I I I think that the chances of a pandemic um, treaty negotiation are are quite. I'm, I'm optimistic about that. That will will happen. Um, how far these kinds of ideas will be shaped in those negotiations and taken on in those negotiations remains to be seen. Another challenge that uh, that will need to be addressed is that while this this treaty will be will be uh, negotiated under the auspices of the WHO, many of these aspects will require the involvement of other agencies, such as the World Trade Organization or international finance mechanisms, and that is an, that's another uh, additional. Uh, complexity. Anyway, nothing in this pandemic is uh, is easy, but that should not stop us from trying to find uh, the solutions. So, John, over to you. Okay. Yeah, th that was fantastic. Thank you for that talk. I, um, as I just said, I think that's given me a lot to think about, um, and I'm glad that this is really moving forward. Um, I'm going to take. I'd like to encourage all of our participants. Uh, to pop their questions into the Q&A.
And while I've sort of prompted people to do that, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and, and fire a question first. I, I hope you don't mind. Um, one of the things you spoke about, your first few points about what we could see in the treaty was a, effectively a bargaining over IP rights and know-how um, for support um, and financing. I was wondering though, do you think there's scope for a baseline of information or technology? Um, some people would call it sort of upstream that perhaps shouldn't during a pandemic, shouldn't be afforded intellectual property protection or shouldn't be enforced. And to illustrate this, one of the things I've been thinking was that the sequence for COVID-19 was published um, very early on, and to my knowledge, wasn't put in a patent application, at least not the sequence per se. But in some jurisdictions, it plausibly could have been. Um, and that could, could present some difficulties, especially given, you know, the, we rely so heavily on diagnostics. Yeah. No, I, I, that that is a that is a very that is a very good uh, very good point. Um, in in a way, of course, the discussions around the the trips waiver at the world world trade organ that is that's taking place at the world trade organization um, has that same notion that in during a pandemic, um, none of the IP that is necessary to um, for for the response. Um, uh, should be enforced. Should be enforceable. The problem is that you have a pre-pandemic situation where knowledge or IP may be created that would then not fall in that that regime. That's one. That is that. That's one aspect. The other is with regard to the products, and I know that that that's not what your question was about. But with regard to the, um, in particular, the vaccines, uh, it isn't just an the non-enforcement of the IP will not get you what you need. So there needs to be an element of you're actually obliged to collaborate with this tech transfer. Moderna has said uh, last year that they would never, they would not enforce their IP. They were referring to their patents. Now, there's a bit of a complex story behind that because the question is, is was is that really their IP? Because some of these patents are contested by others, so that was probably part of a broader strategy. Um, but it was also fairly clear that that was quite a meaningless, uh, in terms of access to the technology, a meaningless declaration, because uh, entities that went to Moderna and said, "Well, great, but could we go a step further and you 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 show us how it's being done?" Uh, Moderna said, "No, that that we're not going to do. We're not going to transfer our um, our technology." So also to that that in my in my mind that should actually not be allowed. The sharing should be the norm, uh, a bit like you have with the virus the virus sharing. If you if you um, in 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 an outbreak you uh, if there is an outbreak somewhere, you share that information so that that is available uh, for others. So I, I suspect that the point you raise will be a subject for for the pandemic treaty negotiations. Definitely. Okay, yeah, I certainly hope it is. I'd like to see those discussions. Um, I'll switch over to a question coming in uh, from uh, Rumi Yutova, uh, a lecturer here in Cambridge. She says, how can we ensure sufficiently wide participation in this treaty by developed states, especially those whose companies produce vaccines and have a very strong lobby? Well, the, the, uh, the, 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 the negotiations will be what's called open-ended. Open so all countries can, can participate. Um, the, um, what will be very important is that developing countries collaborate and, and coordinate. It's interesting that it's the European Union that is the big proponent of the, uh, of the pandemic treaty. And among some developing countries, there's some hesitancy uh, to enter into uh, pandemic uh, uh, treaty negotiations because they fear they may end up in a worse situation than they are than they are now. So 
that, that we'll we'll see in November how that is going to uh, how that is going to play out. So in principle, all countries can uh, can participate. Um, the scope of the treaty has also not been uh, not been determined. So we'll also know more about that in um, in November. Um, but you can be sure that the pharmaceutical industry will be all over this because the the kind of the kind of measures that need to be put in place are the measures that they really don't want to see. Um, I hope that one of the consequences of that will be a greater willingness from the industry side because the industry plays a usually plays a plays a, a significant role in, in such negotiations that isn't always visible, but that is definitely, is definitely the case. But I hope that this, um, if sort of the bar is set high enough during these negotiations, that the industry then also will come with better proposals than what they have put on the table so far. Okay, um, thanks for that answer. Um, we've got a few questions coming in now. So uh, I'll move to one from Henning, um, Henning Ruskan here in SIPL as well. He says, given the amount of profit Pfizer et al are making, what incentives will these companies have to enter into the, the affordable buyouts or other conditionalities which require sharing of IP, tech and know-how? Yeah, that, that is, uh, I don't have the answer to that. When I saw the, the, the magnitude of this market, um, I thought, well, there, there, go, <laughs> there goes the possibility for buyouts. That is, uh, I, I think that is, that is a past station with regard to this, um, to this vaccine. But if this had happened at a much earlier state, when it was still the BioNTech uh, vaccine, and when the German government put half a billion into the development of the vaccine and would have put some conditions on that financing, the situation would be very diff different. Still, companies would be making money selling the vaccine, but it would have, would have happened under a very different set of, uh, of conditions. So we have to look at the regulation of the, of the vac vaccine development at a much earlier state. And if countries can come together under these treaty negotiations to say, we're all going to contribute to the financing of the, of the tools that are necessary um, on the basis that we will all also benefit from the results of that financing, that would be a very good, uh, that would be a very good starting point. Basically, no one knows, um, where the next vaccines will come from. I mean, but there are uh, perhaps in the in the next pandemic, uh, you know, the first ones to market may be Chinese or Brazilian vaccines or Cuban vaccines. Um, so when they are not there yet, or when they are in very early development, that is a much easier phase to to regulate some of this. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting response because I mean, if we were to have another vax, uh, sorry, another pandemic, say in five years, then the memory of Pfizer and BioNTech, the living memory within those companies, would be that actually we made so much money out of the last one, we don't need the funding this time around, especially if we can avoid the conditionalities as as you described. But if we think of it longer term, more than five years, if we think 80 years, for example, or 100 years back to the Spanish influenza, although I don't think we're calling it Spanish influenza now, the last <laughs> pandemic in Europe, let's say, um, then actually the pharma industry in the 1920s didn't look anything like it did today. And so it's actually foreseeable that if in the next 80 or 100 years that you know, whatever the treaty looks like now with these conditionalities will actually just have such little relevance to the industry as we see it. Mm. Um, but I suppose, you know, we can't do anything about that. We can't look into our crystal balls and 
and predict the future but <laughs> no. of course a lot of the problems that we see with COVID-19 vaccines are problems you see with many other important pharmaceutical products including including vaccines where where products benefit from significant public financing uh, a lot of the a lot of the innovations start and sometimes go quite far in in development in academic in a, a, academic uh, centers um, but there is this moment where then that knowledge and ip gets privatized or transferred and, and becomes privatized and control is then lost. I, th I, I think there's a, a real um, responsibility uh, amongst uh, academic centers to, to think more deeply about what, what, you know, what their role is in this, because you, you, you know, I often see this sort of surprise of, oh dear, now someone else runs off with my, my product and we have no say over this. And I think, oh, is that really true? Couldn't you have made some uh some conditions uh put down some conditions when the ip and the know-how gets uh, gets transferred there's more and more debate about that uh these mm -hmm. days i think oxford university certainly uh played a, a, an important role in the astrazeneca pol uh, policy that is mm -hmm. and astrazeneca i sort of feel sorry for them because they get such a bad rep <laughs> their vaccine has a bad reputation while well, there's actually nothing wrong with it and they're uh, they're the only company that has had a a, a a solid access strategy that has immediately transferred the ip and the know-how they have committed to non-for-profit pricing which they're actually doing and they have committed to opening the books to transparency those who purchase from them can actually check that they the price they get is indeed uh, non-for-profit that they should get some um some kudos for that <laughs> instead they have um, I, I think they need to replace our communications department probably because um, Pfizer has has played a, played a role in that. And um, anyway, you know, you don't often hear me say I feel sorry for a drug company, but I think AstraZeneca <laughs> is getting a bad rep. Um, yeah. But, but this is all to say, uh, Oxford University or or the General Institute played a role in making that happen. That's uh, that's quite clear. No one has seen the, the agreements between those entities, but I think that isn't generally, uh, generally known. And that's, that is something I think we'll, we'll learn more about as, as time, as time goes on. Yeah. I mean, I think it might be an area of research that we could look at now or well, yeah. not right now we can have that's dinner it. after this, but the <laughs> idea of these conditions in intellectual property transfers, yeah. um, when they go to private hands, I've heard um just here in, in cambridge other technologies when they've been transferred out certain conditions to the benefit of the local uh, uh medicine supply the nhs and perhaps we should actually collect these examples like some people collect the examples of all the um other instances in ip such as compulsory licensing and that once yeah. we collect them all we might actually see that there's more examples across the world than we initially thought and yeah. I've there are also said, some some models there of, of good uh, good licensing practices and uh, you know, there are groups campaigning for it um, and and trying to work with their tech tech transfer offices to sort of change the the policy of the, uh, of the of the universities. So that would definitely be a useful piece of research to sort of map out what's what's out there, what's being done, and is it sufficient? Uh, and are there are there other or better ways of doing this? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Perhaps we're just at the start of attaching conditions to the transfer of IP. Um, so we actually had a question that came in almost as you started, and I so I should scan back to the start of it. Um, the question is, how do you think we can optimize the overlap and relationship between the pandemic treaty, supposing there is one, the GISRS, which for those who don't know is the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System, which is maintained by WHO, the PIP framework, which is the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework, um, the Nagoya Protocol, and the WHO Biohub. Um, that's a lot of organizations and setups, but yeah, do you see a relationship between any or all of those? 
Well, I, I have not looked into this specifically, but as I as I mentioned to you um, er, earlier, John, we, we had a, a, a working group, a two day working group with, with people who are um, uh, working on preparing for the pandemic treaty negotiations or who are studying in it from 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 a, from a different uh, capacity. And there the issue of particularly the PIP framework and the Nagoya protocol came up. The, the sharing of the, the, the whole issue of the benefit, the benefit sharing, um, how that exactly would 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 pan out in a pandemic treaty, I I don't know, but this is certainly on the radar screen of those that are more deeper in the weeds than uh, uh, than I am. I'm no expert on these other uh, on these other mechanisms, so I can't really say um, much more much more than that. Um, if with the WHO bio hub, that no, that's those are not the tech transfer hubs, right? That's not what's what is meant. But those would also have to be sort of sort of listed. CTAP is another one. Uh, you have some of these mechanisms that potentially could play a very important role if they had a better legal underpinning. So there's a lot of um, a lot of gray area that needs to be colored in. Yeah, that's right. We're right at the start of thinking about how this how this proposed treaty would fit in with other regimes. Um, and I mean, this might get the same answer. And this one, another question, related question from Henning, following up on his other point, um, when we were talking about the um, idea that the companies might avoid the conditions on the uh, sharing of IP, he said, um, if countries were to mandate such re requirements for the sharing of IP um, and able to further participate in government funded research or collaboration with the government, would that be consistent with WTO and FTA rules on government procure procurement and subsidies? Um, I don't think that there would be any, I'm looking for the, for the question. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's the second part of the... Yeah, it's the second yeah. part. Yeah. I, I don't, I am no expert on um, the, the WTO rules on, on government uh, procurement, but I have also not been at a WTO seminar or meeting where we've discussed these things in great detail. The WTO is one of the great proponents at the moment for attaching those conditions and uh, putting mechanisms in place for the transfer of the uh, of the technology where this had come up as a as an issue. Um, the uh, and, and if it is, then that would be a good example of something that needs to be addressed in a pandemic preparedness treaty because such rules could should not hamper the effective use of the technologies that are uh, and the sharing of it that are uh, that are necessary okay yeah and that is one of Henning's um, specializations so I've got a feeling he might follow up with you on at a later date yeah I would love to hear more about that learn more about that yeah okay oh um, we just had a question come in from uh, Rochelle Dreyfus in New York. Um, how do you transfer know-how? How do you know when it's been effectively and completely transferred? Well, forcing the transfer of know-how, if if that was possible, I think it would have happened. It would have happened by now. That is that is that is the whole that is the whole problem uh, of 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 the system. You see, um, if you look at the um, the proposals by the European Union, for example, at the TRIPS Council, they're all about compulsory licensing. Um, the European Union is arguing that there is sufficient flexibility in the current IP system, that we don't need anything else, and uh, we should perhaps tweak here and there the compulsory licensing system, but that's it. But you can't compulsory license trade secrets. Uh, that is the compulsory licensing is very effective when we're talking about patents, but even if there is in, in a country where, where you have a, a data exclusivity regime, you will fairly quickly run into problems that you can't register the product that you would like to import or produce under a compulsory license. So the whole issue of um, transfer of know-how um, 
and how to uh, how to force force that certainly uh, cross borders is 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 very difficult at the national level you could imagine the use of competition law that has actually happened in the Netherlands in during this pandemic where Roche refused to disclose the specifications of a particular substance that was necessary for the test for the, for the running of their testing machines and uh, the government intervened so that is one way of forcing technology transfer by just hammering with your fist on the table and say we won't accept this um, and the competition authorities immediately said we're going to investigate and that led Roche to sort of turn around and say okay we'll give you the recipe so that would be uh, but that is very difficult you don't have that reach into an, another another jurisdiction so that would be um, would not be very helpful if you want to uh, get the technology from from elsewhere brazil is at the moment uh, sort of contemplating um amendments to its patent to its ip law that would um uh, cover trade secrets and the forced disclosure of trade secrets but how you you enforce that or how is that is not entirely clear and there are also voices um, in Brazil saying we need to remove that from this draft piece of legislation so I don't know how that how far that is going to go um, the, in, in a way then the the transfer of the technology from vaccines, the transfer of the technology requires a level of collaboration. And it is in the interest of the entity that transfers it that that is done correctly, that that is done properly. When you talk to the to drug companies who who um, who are willing to do this, um, there is a level of complexity there and there is a level of concern that if you don't do it properly, you end up with someone producing your vaccine, um, not according to standards. So that would be an incentive to get that right. I mean, this is very vaccine and, and uh, to a certain extent medicine specific, but that would be an, an important um, incentive. Uh, the other uh, example that we have uh, in, in global health of tech transfer are the uh, the WHO influenza technology transfer hubs that were set up some years ago in collaboration with 11 different countries where the technology for the production of influenza vaccines were uh, were transferred all the right experts were involved in that and that that initiative has been extremely successful and has led to expanded production in all of these 11 countries so uh, there are models out there that can be used and in fact these influenza tech transfer hubs by the WHO are now the model for these um, for the for the mRNA hub uh, that they are um, that they're planning to set up uh, but they also recognize that it would go much faster if there was a level of collaboration by a company like Moderna yeah an element of goodwill would be useful there um, and you, you pointed to the idea of um, the competition authorities maybe stepping in um, which although it involves another sort of legal organism and mechanism um, could be useful but is there another role perhaps for regulatory authorities um, in the sense that typically when drugs and diagnostics are authorized there's a certain amount of confidential information um, often about processes because the um, reagents and things like that often have to be disclosed in methods so the regulatory authority can know that it's not dangerous and it abides by best practice and things like that. But in certain instances, the know-how could be located in the depths of those documents as well. Could, yeah. could a role be played, and maybe this could be linked in with the treaty in some respect of those books being opened up contra in, in, in contravening confidentiality agreements. Yeah. Yeah, and that is definitely and and um, a lot of a lot of the useful knowledge sits with regulatory agency, and that is not only the knowledge necessary to register products, but the knowledge that you could actually use to um, uh, to increase or expand the manu manufacturing. Um, that is 
regulated in, in medicines, uh, medicines regulations. And often these medicines regulations have exceptions for the, uh, the confidential information that the agency has, but they're hardly ever uh, invoked. So that would be talking about another area of work would be under which conditions can regulatory agencies, or for example, the European Medicines Agency disclose confidential information when that would be necessary, when that would be required for global health or public health. That, that would be um, uh, an important important issue to look into. Yeah, yeah. So the answers to um, Rochelle's questions are in short, with great difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have another question from Lionel Bentley, uh, again here in Cambridge. Um, he said, you contrast the fact that BioNTech was given half a billion in public funding and Pfizer's turnover in 2021 was 33 and a half billion. Do you have any idea as to the investment of Pfizer and how much of that turnover was profit? No, I, I don't, but I suspect it isn't a vast amount of, of money because Pfizer obtained an almost ready vaccine from BioNTech. Um, sure, Pfizer will have made investments in um, in, in, in expanding the manufacturing capacity. They've, they have done that and they have done that themselves. Moderna has not. Moderna has received financing from the US government to do that, 1.2 billion. Um, AstraZeneca also received financing from the UK government to, to expand um, the manufacturing uh, capacity. So I, I think it's safe to say that a large chunk of that 33.5 billion turnover is um, is profit. Um, I think by the end of this year, we'll have a bit better picture of, of, uh, of how this is all divvied up, but um, it's, it's an, that, and that, that is of course reflected in the share price of these companies. They, these are, this is the biggest pharmaceutical product in the history of, of pharma. They've never seen a product of this size. And it, what's, what I find fascinating is that if you go back to the beginning of the pandemic, these same companies said, we're not interested. We don't want to engage in this vaccine stuff unless we get a lot more money. Mm -hmm. And now everyone is scrambling to get a piece of the pie. Well, that's right. I mean if that, one, that landscape has changed so rapidly. That's right. If there's one thing we can learn from this, it's that certain fact, isn't it? That people will make money from a pandemic. Yeah. Um, and that, that in itself is not, you know, I think it's fine if companies make a profit and make money. That also keeps the system going. But the question is, at what expense and at what, um, and at what level? And does that also then mean that they determine where the products are sold and where they become available. And that is, that is the bigger, that is the bigger question. Well, you're right. And um, Lionel's followed up on his question with another right on that point. Um, is there any interest in using Thomas Pogg's, I've never worked out whether it's Pogg or Poggy health impact fund as a model in the pandemic treaty. Um, I'm not sure you've heard of this. It's a sort of old model that continually sort of gets re-agitated again. Are you familiar? Yeah, it, uh, yeah, I'm familiar with it. I, I, it has not come up um, in in this uh, in this context. Um, so the answer is, as far as I know, I I, I don't think so. Um, I, I I I think with regard to, um, I, I would be wary of having a fund to finance this. I think you need multiple sources. You need multiple countries um, in, involved. Um, so I'm, I'm not a proponent of a, a global vaccine fund for the development of pandemic vaccines or something like that. I don't think that that is the best way to go. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's basically what I've got to say about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe another topic for a discussion at another time, because it certainly changes the dynamics of everything. Now, I'm conscious that we've sort of hit time here, and 
I've been a little bit rude in that there's a few questions that I haven't um, posed to you yet. Um, there's one that is still at the top of the q and I'm not sure if you can see it, um, from Axel, who says, um, what is preferable, a pandemic treaty or the IHR 2005 revision? Is he talking about the... International health regulations. Yeah. Are you yeah. familiar with that? Can you? Yeah, 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 that? yeah. And that is um, that is a bit the debate that's going on in Geneva at the moment. Uh, shouldn't we just just amend the international health regulations? Uh, some are arguing that would be preferable because that is an opt out system. So once it's amended and you don't want it, you have to opt out, not opt in. While well, a treaty you can negotiate and you can have a text, but then the ratification process starts and it may take forever before this thing actually goes into force. Um, but the problem with the international health regulations is that a lot of these issues that need addressing, such as issues of intellectual property sharing, don't really fit in the IHR mode. So what the, um, uh, the, the way things are seem to be going in Geneva is to do both, to amend the international health regulations there where it's necessary, um, but have that go alongside a pandemic treaty that addresses the other, other issues that don't have a home, so to speak. And the whole, uh, the whole area of, of, of IP and, and tech transfer and know-how sharing would fall under the category of issues that, doesn't, that do not have a home. So that's... Well, that, yeah, that's a relief because I mean, one of the classic issues for lawyers and particularly IP lawyers when you start looking at domestic and mul multiple domestic and multiple international agreements is all of a sudden there starts being a, a patchwork of overlapping interests mm. so yeah. new home would be nice um, but probably not to the exclusion of other considerations so I have one more question for you um, it's from Alex Ferguson it's actually if you're looking at it, it's the second half of his question because we effectively answered the enforcement of um, sharing of know-how, et cetera. Except the second half, he said, um, oh, if, would the treaty that requires governments to insert a clause into a contract with, with the funding agency, and if the government does not insert the clause mandating, um, I assume it means no mandating IP sharing or sharing of know-how, um, would this lead to an international dispute between the states or would there be some sort of enforcement to make sure they put that sharing mechanism in the contract? Well, I, I, ideally, but I, I am not entirely sure that a treaty under the WHO um, can, can go that far, that there would actually be reper repercussions. Mm -hmm. um, so that is that is an area that needs some you know, a lot of, a lot of thought. How do you, um, yeah, how do you deal with the enforcement? But that is true for all of the you know, the WHO um, rules and rules and regulations. Yeah, yeah, I think it's an it's an interesting point to finish on because I was at a um, meeting under Chatham House rules um, two weeks ago and. Uh, former um, leading policymaker from a certain anonymous country that will remain anonymous said, we don't want to share our know-how from our leading companies. That's the way our country maintains its competitive advantage. And we're concerned about losing all our competitive advantages, which- Yeah, guess... the economic, the economic um, uh, interests and the interest of, of, of governments to protect their own industries is will you know we'll, we'll see that play out again in this pandemic in this pandemic treaty. You, you think this is about global health, but there will be a huge economic undercurrent um, running running the show. It's what you also see at the WTO happening. If you look at the position of the European member states, it's actually very divided. Diff different European EU members have very different approach uh, or positions. Of course, at the WTO, it's the European Union that operates in one in one voice, and that is basically dictated by Germany. 
who is protect, protecting now the very significant financial interest of BioNTech. Mm. And that's... Yeah, what, what's your response to that? What do you say to, to the protection of natural, national interests at that, like that? Well, th that is a that is the tension in these in in these talks. Now, in a pandemic context, uh, you can very convincingly make the case that you shouldn't be too short sighted, um, because ultimately uh, the cost of not addressing pandemics of this kind is a whole whole lot higher than uh, having some uh, consequences for one one biotech company in your within your within your borders um, but overall the economic interests always play an enormously important role in these discussions in global health fora yeah. that's that is that is nothing new uh, but we've also seen in, in in the history that despite that sometimes, the right thing happens anyway. So let's yeah. be optimistic. <laughs> be optimistic and it's a it's a discussion that's going to be go around and around for a while. Yeah. I think we've had a few more questions come in, but I think um we I know I I'm need getting to start hungry. cooking, really. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> my household. <laughs> so um unfortunately in this virtual environment, um I'm if, if it wasn't virtual, you would hear a rousing applause. But unfortunately, you're just going to have to believe me that um, we all thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Um, and I'm sure those who questions I haven't posed, um, um, I'm sure there'll be another opportunity. But and you uh, forget to mention if this wasn't virtually, we would now all go in the pub to the pub and sort yeah. it all out. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a fake background. I'm at the pub at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. I hope to see you in person some other time. But I'm, I'm sure that's gonna, that, that, that will happen. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. Bye. Bye bye.